After showing that B2 is a linear and unbiased estimator, now we have to show that B2 is best. That is, B2 is an efficient estimator. And by efficiency, we mean that B2 has minimum variance in the class of linear unbiased estimators. See, the thing that you have to understand here is that the estimators that you get by using the method of OLS are not the only estimators that are linear and unbiased. There are many other methods that can give us linear and unbiased estimators. But the good thing about the OLS method is that the variance of the estimators that you get from the OLS method is less than the variance of the estimators that you could get from any other method. Okay. So that means to prove that B2 OLS is efficient, we have to show that variance of B2 OLS is less than equal to the variance of B2 that you get using another method. So AM means another method. Now note that I'm writing less than equal to here, but usually this inequality is strict. Okay. And by any chance, if you are wondering that why is minimum variance of an estimator considered a good thing, then I would suggest you to go back to your statistics course and revise the concepts of sampling and the properties of a good estimator. This is something that you should definitely know from your statistics course. Okay. So this is what we mean by best. Now see, I'm going to divide this proof into two lectures. So in this lecture, I'm going to find the formula to calculate variance of B2 OLS. And once we have found the variance of B2 OLS, then in the next lecture, I will discuss how to show that variance of B2 OLS is less than the variance of any other linear unbiased estimator. So now let's get started with the proof and let's find the variance of B2 OLS. Now see, in this lecture, I'm going to work with B2 OLS only. So I'm not going to say and write OLS again and again. I hope that is understood. Okay. So if we have to calculate the variance of a random variable and let's say that the random variable is X, then one of the formulas that we have is this. So this is one of the formulas that we have to calculate the variance of a random variable and to calculate the variance of B2, this is the formula that I'm going to use. So using this formula, I can write that variance of B2 is equal to expectations. Then within bracket, I have B2 minus expectations of B2 and then whole square. Now note that we have already discussed that B2 is an unbiased estimator. That means we already know that expectation of B2 is equal to beta 2. So we can use that result here. So using that result, we can write that variance of B2 is equal to expectations and within bracket, we have B2 minus beta 2 whole square. Now, if you recall, when we were discussing the unbiasedness of B2, I decomposed the formula to calculate B2 into a fixed component and a random component. And the formula was this. So I wrote that B2 is equal to beta 2 plus summation ki ui. So this is one of the formulas that we discussed while proving the unbiasedness of B2. And using this, I can write that B2 minus beta 2 is equal to summation ki ui, right? So this is what B2 minus beta 2 is equal to. And now I'm going to substitute this in this expression. So after doing the substitution, I get that variance of B2 is equal to expectation of summation k i u i whole square. And if I expand this, then I can write that this is equal to expectation of k1 u1 plus k2 u2. And this can go on till k n u n whole square. So variance of B2 is now equal to this. Now let's see how to solve this expression. The main struggle in solving this expression is solving this bracket. Once we are done solving this bracket, then we just have to apply the expectations. Okay. So let's see how can we solve this term that I have highlighted here. Let's do one exercise to see how can we solve this particular term. So this term is nothing but summation k i u i whole square, right? Now let's assume that i is not varying from 1 to n. Hypothetically, let's say that i is varying from 1 to 2. 
if i is varying from 1 to 2 that means i can write this as k1 u1 plus k2 u2 whole square right and this is quite easy to solve we can just use the formula a plus b square equal to a square plus b square plus 2ab where i'm calling this a and i'm calling this b so we can just apply this basic formula right so applying this formula we get that this right hand side is equal to k1 u1 square plus k2 u2 square plus twice of k1 u1 and k2 u2 so basically if we assume that i varies from 1 to 2 and if we solve the right hand side we get that we have to square and add the individual terms that we have and we also have to add the cross product of these two terms multiplied by 2 okay now let's continue with this exercise but now let's assume that i is varying from 1 to 3 okay so now let's work with the case where i is varying from 1 to 3 so if i is varying from 1 to 3 then i can write this term as k1 u1 plus k2 u2 plus k3 u3 whole square and we know that to solve this particular expression i can use this formula so we know that a plus b plus c whole square is equal to a square plus b square plus c square plus 2ab plus 2ca plus 2bc so this is the formula that i'm going to use to solve this expression so if i solve this formula i can write that the right hand side is equal to k1 u1 square plus k2 u2 square so basically i am thinking of this as a this as b and this as c so this will become plus k3 u3 square plus twice of k1 u1 multiplied by k2 u2 plus twice of k3 u3 multiplied by k1 u1 plus twice of k2 u2 multiplied by k3 u3 so basically in this case where your i is varying from 1 to 3 we are first squaring and adding the individual terms that we have right and then we are doing cross multiplication of these terms and we have a 2 here okay and now we are going to apply the same approach for the case where i is varying from 1 to n so let's see how can we solve for that using this approach. So now let's go back to the original case. So originally we had summation k i u i whole square and i was going from 1 to n. In this case i was going from 1 to 3 and in the earlier case i was going from 1 to 2. So we can write that this is k1 u1 plus k2 u2 and this can go on till k n u n whole square. Now using this approach what we can do now so we can now first square and add all the individual terms that we have so first i can write that this is equal to k1 u1 square plus k2 u2 square and this can go on till k n u n square okay so this is the first step now we also have to incorporate for the cross product terms that is these kind of terms so if you have to incorporate for cross product terms, how can we write it? So we can write that the first term would be 2k1 u1 multiplied by k2 u2. And we can write the second term will be 2k2 u2 multiplied by k3 u3. And this can go on and on till the last term where we will have 2kn minus 1 u n minus 1 multiplied by k n u n so this is how i'm generalizing it i hope this much is okay but see right now this expression is quite long so let's use the summation sign to write a shorter version of this expression so we can write that the expression that we have on the right hand side is equal to summation k i u i whole square and i is going from 1 to n so basically when I am writing this, I am taking care of all these n terms, right? So I am writing these n terms as summation k i u i whole square i going from 1 to n, okay? So this is simple. 
Now let's see how can I use this summation for these cross product terms that we have here. So using summation, I can write the second term as twice double summation k i u i k j u j where i is going from 1 to n j is also going from 1 to n and i is not equal to j. Now let's understand the second term that I have written here. The main thing that we have to understand here is that why am I using double summation here and why cannot we have i equal to j. See it will not be right to use the single summation in the second term because have a look at the cross product terms that we have here. So you have one here and you have one here and you have two here and you have two here. So see if you have k1 here then you have k2 here. If you have u1 here then you have u2 here. And that is why we are introducing both i and j. So that's why I'm writing k i u i and k j u j. And obviously you have to make sure that i is not equal to j. In the cross product term if you have one here then you have two here. If you have two here then you have three here. This is the reason that i cannot be equal to j. Okay. I understand this could be confusing for some students but sit on it for a couple of minutes and you'll be able to get it. So see what we have done till now. So I have written an expression for summation k i u i whole square and the expression that I have written is this. But we are not done yet. If you recall the variance of b2 is equal to expectation of this particular expression. So now we have to complete the proof. So basically the variance of b2 is equal to expectation of this expression. So the expectation of summation k i u i whole square where i is going from 1 to n. And now we can write that variance of b2 is equal to expectation of summation k i u i square plus twice summation i going from 1 to n, j also going from 1 to n and i not equal to j, k i u i k j u j okay now let's simplify this term that we have on the right hand side so we can write that this is equal to expectation summation and inside bracket i can write k i square u i square and i'm writing the second term as plus 2 double summation see the k's are non stochastic and these terms are multiplying with each other so i can club k's together so I can write ki kj and I can club u's together. So ui uj and once again i is going from 1 to n and i is not equal to j. So now we can write that this is equal to expectation of summation ki square ui square plus expectation of twice double summation ki kj ui uj. Now see we have already discussed that ki's are non-stochastic variables and while applying expectations on a non-stochastic variable you can treat it like a constant. So that means the first term will become summation ki square expectations ui square. So the expectation will only be applied on the ui square and similarly the second term will become twice double summation ki kj expectation of ui uj. So we will apply expectation of ui uj and not on ki kj. Now let's use the assumptions that we have taken to simplify this. So using the assumption of homoscedasticity we can write that this is nothing but sigma square right and using the assumption of no autocorrelation we can say that this is equal to zero. So now in this case we are using both the assumptions the assumption of homoscedasticity and the assumption of no autocorrelation. So this implies that this is equal to summation k i square multiplied by sigma square which is a particular constant plus zero. And because sigma square is constant so we can factor it out and we can write that variance of b2 is equal to sigma square multiplied by summation k i square. Now there is one last step that we have to do here. If you recall the properties of k i we discussed that summation k i square is equal to 1 divided by summation small xi square. 
And this implies that we can write variance of B2 is equal to sigma square multiplied by 1 divided by summation small xi square. And this is the final formula that we have to calculate the variance of B2 OLS. Now see you can also think about the features of this formula that we have calculated here. So basically variance of B2 is positively related with sigma square and it is negatively related with summation small xi square. However, because this is a mathematical course, so I'm not going to explain you the intuition behind these linkages, okay? Now before I end this lecture, there is one last thing that I want to discuss with you. Now see, these are the assumptions that we have. So let's see to calculate the variance of B2, how many assumptions have we used? If you recall in the very first step, we wrote beta 2 in place of expectations of B2 using the unbiasedness property. So that means we have indirectly utilized these three properties because these are the three properties that you need for unbiasedness. And as you just saw in the last couple of steps, we also utilize the property of homoscedasticity and the property of no autocorrelation. So to find this formula of variance of B2 OLS, ideally we have utilized all our major assumptions. Obviously except this assumption number 6 because that's something we don't need for Gauss-Markov theorem. So that means now if you encounter a situation in which the assumption of homoscedasticity is not holding, that is if there is heteroscedasticity, then you cannot use this formula to calculate variance of B2. Similarly, if you encounter a situation where the assumption of no autocorrelation is not satisfied, you cannot use this particular formula to calculate variance of B2. I hope this much is clear. So this is all for this lecture. In my next lecture, I will show you how can we compare the variance of B2 OLS with the variance of B2 that we get from any other method.